Thank you all so much for joining us today. This is Art Speaks, a Common Thread, um, Textiles as Social Practice. So a little bit about a common thread. So a common thread is our annual member exhibition that we hold at Textile Center. It takes up all of the gallery space in the actual center. It's one of our favorite, favorite shows. Um, it shows all different ranges of techniques, including but not limited to, there's so many, bear with me, stitching, quilting, knitting, weaving, crochet, sewing, dyeing, belting, hand construction, polymer, clay, basketry, and mixed media. So anything and everything textiles or textile based, we want to see it. So this year, this is our 21st common thread exhibition. And usually, at least in the past year or so, it was originally held in winter. But this year we have it open in the summer. So it is on until October 16th. If you get the chance to come into Textile Center, please do so. There's some really amazing work. And uh, there is a total of 131 pieces. So you'll have plenty of different items to see. Along with that, we have our Textile Center shop open and uh, just a lot of really fantastic work. So in terms of how this session is going to um, uh, be structured. So we will be talking with four of our wonderful member artists. So we have Mimi Goodwin, Jerry Oliver, Nora Rickey, and Ruth Stevens. So thank you all so much for joining us today. In terms of how this is going to work, going on and forward with that. So if anyone has any questions throughout the session, please feel free to put them in the chat if you can, um, just to make sure all the artists are able to speak and talk about their work. We'll be going one by one, making sure they're uh, talking about their work and the work that they have in the show. And we'll be focusing the last 15 to 20 minutes to questions that all of you may have, along with questions that the artists may have with each other and uh, questions that I may have at the end of the question, at the end of the session for each of the artists. So um, did anyone have any questions or can everyone hear me okay? I'm seeing head nods, thumbs up, smiles, fantastic. Okay, so without further ado, we will move on. Um, I wanted to start with talking about social practice in art. So I wanted to start with this definition just so everyone gets a, you know, a general scope of what this is. It is a very general, a very open, flexible sort of term. So social practice in art. Social practice is an art medium focusing on engagement through human interaction and social discourse. Social practice goes by many names, including relational aesthetics, new genre of public art, socially engaged art, dialogical art and participatory art. So a lot of it has to do with how it interacts with other people, how your work may interact with other people in response to other people, so on and so forth, right? So I'll be asking each one of these artists how their work relates to this, along with their general arts practice, specifically their work in the show, um, and in terms of focusing it around uh, textiles as well, since we are the textile center. So we will start with Mimi Goodwin. So Mimi, if you could talk a bit about yourself, your work in the show and uh, how your work relates to uh, social practice. Thank you. And thank you to the textile, for create, textile Center for creating this time of conversation. My name is Mimi Goodwin and I am a textile artist and activist for justice and a theologian. Um, this particular piece, River of Tears, a COVID Requiem, comes from part of what has been so disrupted and impacted during COVID is how it is that we honor our loved ones. And this piece began specifically to honor loved ones who had passed from COVID. And then as I was creating this piece, several friends died from other, other causes. And I deeply realized how COVID has impacted so much of our lives. So it isn't just grieving for our loved ones, it's grieving for those little day-to-day -day losses too, from how we welcome little children into the world throughout our, our whole life. And part of what is missing is how it is that we gather in community during these times. So in terms of social practice, and I think textiles are particularly wonderful because of the layering and the, and the textures and so many ways that textiles can create images. 
And so this image of a river of tears and rivers and water is what gives us life. There's a constancy and also a changing in the rivers around us. And so here is this piece. Um, in terms of engaging with community, as I was sharing this piece with text of the piece in progress, people would text back stories and some people came and into the studio and would just stroke the water and begin to share their stories and accept the invitation to choose specific beads to honor their specific people. For me, community is really central to who and how I am in the world. And in this time of needing to shelter in place so much of the time, it's been really challenging. So creating this piece and participating in We Are the Story, that has been a way through the art to continue to engage and be a part of community. And in terms of my art process, um, I think as artists, part of what we, how we walk in the world and how we invite other people to be is to be paying attention, to be listening and watching closely. And then as a textile artist, the question is, how do I translate this story, this event, this moment in time into textiles? And then there's the sketching and the conversation and the gathering of the materials and beginning to create. It seems like it's a lot. It, it takes every step of the process from the idea to getting the materials to talking about the work itself that it seems to really connect. So that's perfect. Thank you, Mimi. Yes, and one other part is, in this time, even the spiritual traditions comfort and sustain us has changed. They still very much do sustain us. And at the top of the piece, you can see a stick that is part of the hanging. And that wood comes from Southeast Alaska. And it's a piece of socked, which is one of the healing medicines there. Wow. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Mimi. Appreciate it. Okay, we will move on to Jerry Oliver. If you want to answer the same questions, if you need a reminder, just let me know. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and share this. I um, have taken many classes at the Textile Center and usually do the project at hand and then go home and file it away in my imagination bank. And um, COVID kind of changed that. Well, actually it changed it in a really big way because I haven't exhibited anything or shown anything that I do. I usually am shy and private about it, but because of the events of COVID and what happened with George Floyd and other incidents during COVID, I really felt as though I had to speak and not so much for my, on my own behalf, but for the on the behalf of my grandson, Gabriel, who's the one that's pictured at the center of, of the image. Um, I end, I end, because of some health condition events, I ended up being in quarantine in Georgia with my daughter and, and my grandchildren. And it certainly, it was, a, it was a stressful time, but it turned out to be a real special time because I had the opportunity to spend with all of them, but in particular, Gabriel, who was going through the, I mean, he was working through the events of what was happening around him as a 14 year old boy, as a 14 year old black boy. And, you know, as a family, we'd never really had conversation about color. It, it just never really came up because he's, he's lived a pretty, um, pretty steady life. And there has, hasn't been a whole lot of social challenge that he's had to deal with. So this created an opportunity for he and I to spend some time together getting to understand one another. So um, I took a class from Jackie Abrams when Gabe was probably about nine. And in the class, we painted watercolor paper and put it through the pasta machine and made a basket. And I did that, but I never finished the basket. 
because I didn't know what I would do with it. To me, a basket is meant to be um, an object of utility and beauty, but I didn't know what I was going to do with it. So um, it sat there for a while. And then with all the events of what was happening in our world, I decided that I needed to do something to speak about what Gabe was feeling at that time and what I, I, and I was feeling about Gabriel in the times. So I picked up the basket and finished it, put the, the red rim around it and drew the picture of Gabe and embroidered it and beaded it. And the image is a picture of a bird nesting in his hair. And that was something that happened as we had white knuckled it from Georgia to return me to Minnesota. And not long after we returned home, a bird flew into the window and knocked itself out. I picked it up and put it in Gabe's hair and I fully expected an adolescent reaction. And he gave me the biggest, sweetest smile and I saw such compassion and I was just really struck with the disparity in the image between his compassion and his gentle ways and the images that we were seeing on television. Uh, so that's why I chose that particular image. Um, inside the basket is his COVID hair. He had, he loves his hair big. And when he painted, originally painted the paper for the basket, he said, he, he just, he grew his hair long because it's nice hair and he likes his hair. But now as a result of the events of, of George Floyd around the world and our time together at COVID, he was starting to realize that his hair is, is there's a perception that goes with it too, that he's, he is learning to understand. And he's come to the conclusion that he, because of the color of his skin, he does have to adjust the way he behaves. And he's been cautioned by his father to do that. And he really, he said that he really wants as a result of our awakening and the efforts on behalf of people to, that are working toward equality. Um, he doesn't want any more fathers like his to have to caution him about how to behave in certain circumstances. So the hair is kind of emblematic of who Gabe is, but how also how he may be perceived in the world. And then I nested the basket in the, the, um, the yellow, because the whole image and idea was about healing, um, the bird healing in Gabe's hair and all of us trying to heal through the trauma and the chaos of what we were experiencing last year and, and which continues now. Um, I nested the yellow nest in the midst of the words and the words are absolute to me. They, they say precious boy, precious bird, precious life, precious world. And, I, and I, instead of trying to strive for, for, for perfection with the wording, I wanted it to be really organic to reflect life and to reflect, reflect the fact that Gabe is a child growing into a young man. And then he, I asked him to choose a favorite quote as a result of what he'd experienced. And he chose the Socrates quote that says, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. And he said that with what had happened last summer, that he came to realize more about people and their emotions. And that he realized that he may have been pushing people down by not being aware of loss and that COVID was a reminder that people do feel things and many are hurting and that we can all be helpful. He said, um, there's an image of black people, black people being bad people. And he, and he told me yesterday, he said, People are good and bad, and we've all got the choice of, of which we're going to be. And last year and last summer was his, his wake up call to pay more attention to that. Um, one of the last things he said, oh, and, and there's some black script in there that are filled with memories of our time together. And one of his favorite is puppy chow. Um, he said puppy chow made him happy and us making it together made him happy. And that it um, made him think at two o'clock in the morning that he needed to go downstairs and rescue some of it before I got it. So he said the puppy tail was kind of symbolic of the competitive nature of um, the good times that we were having. And, and then uh, last, I think he said um, that you really, out of COVID and George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery, which happened not far from where he lives, that he just wants all people to be equal and to be recognized as equal. In fact, he said, um, it's kind of a conundrum because he said he was, he felt as though he didn't speak out enough about 
his color at school. And he said that when he started to, to advocate for his color and his race, because he felt the responsibility to do so as a result of George Floyd, that um, he felt people were treating him as, his, as though he was more white because he was being more academic. And, um, and he's also an athlete and he says his color has been an advantage with that or the perception has been an advantage. So he's realizing that he's kind of, he's torn in two directions. And um, the catalyst of, of our, our most recent events has put him in the place to be more, feel more, he said he feels more responsible um, for helping to make changes on behalf of everyone to, and towards equality. So that's why I chose to put the different colored rulers around the outside. They're all equidistant and they're the different colors of different faces. So um, it wasn't a piece that I sat down to create. It was a piece that, that just kind of began and grew and grew and grew as the summer went on. And I just let it sit there for a while. And as each thing began to unfold, I would somehow try to incorporate it into the final piece. Um, on the back is a photographic image of the original photographic image of Gabe and the bird. And um, I'm hoping that it serves as a reliquary of sorts to him of memories of good times during bad times in which he learned so much about himself and, and it was awakened to so many more things in the world. And, um, and that it, it serves as a point of reference for him as he progresses through becoming the person that he's, he is, well, he is now obviously, but um, uh, who he, he intends to be and will be someday. So it's, it's visual, it's philosophical, it's, um, it's healing and it's memory. So that's how it came about. Wow, thank you so much. Um, one quick question for you, how old, how old is he? He was 14 at the time. He is gonna be 16 next month. Wow, has it already been that long, huh? Yeah. Um, thank you so much, that's, that's excellent. Um, we'll go to Nora, Nora Ricky. Hello, um, I'm feeling, wow, that was really moving, Jerry, hearing about your piece. Um, so thank you for sharing about that. Um, yeah, so hi, I'm Nora, Nora Ricky. I use she, they pronouns. Um, and this is my piece, this is my underwear. <laughs> um, this is, yeah, one, one pair of underwear that I've done in a series of embroidered and embellished underwear, um, primarily Hanes underwear. Um, so this piece is called anatomical. And if you aren't able to visual see it, um, I can describe it. <laughs> um, it's, uh, there's a vulva depicted on the underwear with a very um, colorful pink bush and a gold clitoris, um, if we're being really technical about it. Um, I, I don't know why it's like a little awkward to talk about this um, only because I'm still getting comfortable with um, with what I've depicted myself. Um, this piece was made for my best friend Zoe. Um, when I started embroidering underwear, all of my underwear have been inspired by a friend or a family member um, and they've all, yeah, all these underwears are for someone um, as a gift to them and like a uh, resemblance of my love for them. Um, and so I started embroidering underwear and I made my best friend Natalie pair and I made my whole family pair. And then uh, in 2019, Zoe was like, when are you gonna make me a pair of underwear? And so I finally got down to making her a pair. And I, I chose this subject at first because Zoe is an incredible painter and in high school she made this six foot by four foot painting of an anatomical man and she showed the layers of bone, blood vessels, and muscle as well as the outer layer of skin and I just like that painting was so cool to me that 
someone I knew my age was making that. And then she continued to make really incredible anatomical pieces throughout college. And she painted one of our friends in a barn um, with the whole anatomical um, like muscle and yeah, yeah, I think it was muscles um, and it was incredible. So that's why I chose this um, particular pair of underwear. Um, yeah, so a little more about me as an artist. I am a self-taught fiber artist and uh, educator. And I started teaching myself how to embroider in 2016. Before that, I lived in New York City and then I moved back to Minnesota in 2016. And um, I'd been an actor and I went to, I studied acting in New York City, but when I came back, I wanted to connect more with my mom and with my, all the women in my life, all of my like ancestors. Um, my mom passed away when I was in college, when I was 19 and she was a fiber artist and costume designer and painter and she was incredible. Um, and I, yeah, just needed some way to connect to her and to her practice. And I was just missing her so much. And so I started embroidering and it just took off from there. I like just became obsessed with it. And um, I think embroidering on underwear became like a vehicle for that because I started thinking about, um, first I was thinking about like, oh, what are the, I was thinking about underwear because I wanted people to have the underwear and whoever had them would have this beautiful message that they could have wearing that they could wear and that they could either keep close to themselves or choose to display to others. Um, and so the choice was in the wearer if they wanted an audience or not. Um, and that just like took off where I started thinking about, oh, what are all the different messages that can be used, um, that can be spoken on underwear. And I did some very political stuff in, um, yeah, in 2017 in reaction to the the Trump presidency. And um, I did, yeah, I created some performance art videos where I was dying underwear on, on camera and, um, and would wear underwear underneath my clothes to protest. Um, and so the underwear, yeah, became a way for me to start getting my voice out there. Um, and it also became a way for me to explore textile and fiber arts. And um, yeah, so I taught myself how to embroider, but then it took off from there because I was like, oh, what else can I do to embellish underwear? Can I dye them? Can I felt on underwear? Um, can I make my own underwear? And so last year I even made 10 pairs of underwear and I, I took a class at the textile center on how to make your own underwear and how to, um, I was like, oh my God, this class is literally made for me. It was how to, um, it was with um, Kathleen Reichert, I think. Yeah, and, um, it was how to adjust your, pattern to fit your own body. And I was like, this is exactly the challenge that I've been wanting to take. Um, so that's, yeah, so I started doing that and, and I then would challenge myself to submit to shows. And, and the first, in my first interaction with the textile center was with the Common Thread show back in 2019. I had a, um, um, a pair of underwear with an heirloom carrot on it. And then um, the carrot flower. Um, and that was a really exciting show for me because I came to the opening and I'd already, you know, been engaging with people over my underwear, but at that show, I kind of took a step back and just watched people interact with my underwear. And it was exciting to provoke people, um, whether it was a positive or negative reaction, I didn't really care because I, I think the underwear for me was a way, yeah, of a way to provoke someone to have a reaction. Um, and that's, that was like the desire in showing them off. Um, and so, yeah, people would like get really close to the underwear and almost want to touch it that the pair was very tactile, had a lot of French knots on it. Um, and so, yeah, just, um, I realized coming from a performance art background that my work, it, it has to have some sort of performance element to it. Um, in, in theater there, it's like, you think of it as a triangle, you've got the script, you've got the actor and the stage production, 
But then there's this third component that's important, which is the audience. And they all work together and they all work to create a dynamic and to change the messaging and to interact with one another. Every component is important. And I still feel that that need for an audience still is ingrained in me, even though I'm working now, I've, I've retired from the theater, but I still, I work as a visual artist and um, I still want that audience interaction and um, definitely, yeah, underwear definitely gets a certain um, reaction from people. Um, so yeah, so that's a little bit about like my practice as a as an underwear artist um, and textile artist before this piece. And um, with this piece, I think working on it, I I came out as queer in 2019 while I was working on this piece. And so this piece continues to be a, a way of me examining my queer identity and examining um, other queer identities and my role in the queer community. Um, and I chose to embroider the clitoris with gold thread because I didn't know what a clitoris was until I was in my mid twenties. I went to Catholic school my entire life until I went to New York city and studied acting. Um, but I still didn't know what my body, what, yeah, I didn't know the makeup of my body. And that continues to be something where I'm just appalled that my education didn't introduce fundamental body. Um, you know, and the clitoris is such an incredible organ. And so it's just crazy that I didn't really learn about, and I'm still learning. I still am learning about my body's functions. And so, um, to this day and I'm 27 and I feel like I'm going to be on this um, map of learning to the rest of my life. But um, yeah, so it, it, it began and it became like this way of reckoning and, and analyzing and, and becoming in love with the female, well, not necessarily female because it's, but becoming in love with the vagina and, and breasts and being comfortable with that love and that adoration instead of before where I'd be questioning now I was knowing and I was comfortable in that knowing or becoming comfortable in that knowing of um of yeah of adoration of desire um and so yeah when I think about it yeah this piece is like kind of in a way like I still am processing it it's it feels like it's it was a big moment for me as an artist, but as a human as well, um, as a person. And um, yeah, after that, I, I created a pair of, I crocheted, I designed my own crochet pattern of a huge pair of breasts that people could wear and put on. And it was like a way of putting on femininity. Um, but this, this is like me just trying to get the anatomical figure of the vagina out there and all the different elements of it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's that. I think this is like my last, I, yeah, I'm taking a break from doing underwear. So this kind of felt like a good last piece to finish. Um, I'm going to continue sewing my own underwear. I, I now feel comfortable working with elastic and I want to challenge myself to not purchase new underwear. So I will continue that and probably embellishing more underwear. But as a series, I think this is, this is a great way to conclude working on embellishing underwear in such a like, yeah, loud and wearable art way. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, oh, one more thing. So um, also while I was thinking, while I was doing this piece, I was, you know, reflecting on the Gorilla Girls who are an incredible group um, who challenged museums to include more women and um, I think now they are working in in 2021 to include more people of color and more queer artists in in the Metropolitan Museum and the modern the MoMA and other museums across the world and one of the statistics I think was back in the 80s when they were first starting out was that in the museum they only have in the Metropolitan Museum of Art they only have five percent of the artists are women female artists 
whereas 85% of the images depicted are of female nudes. And so they were saying that, oh, if, you know, the only way to get into the Metropolitan Museum is if you're naked as a woman. And so this was me like also kind of analyzing that history of um, our art history. And um, even though I grew up going to museums, I still didn't know what my body what all my body was made of and like all the different parts of it. So um, yeah, I think, I think that's, those are my thoughts on, on this piece. So thank you Textile Center for um, allowing this opportunity. That's fantastic. Um, it's very interesting, you know, thinking about, you know, even, even hearing you talk about it, starting from a place where you, you didn't know much about the, you know, about this anatomy and then going into, you know, public practice and, you know, wearing underwear at protests. It's like a really bold and exciting jump. And that's a really cool progression that, that I see with your work. So that's awesome to hear. Thank you so much. Um, so from here, we'll go to the last artist um, for this session. So Ruth Stevens. Ruth, I'll let you take it away. Let me say thank you very much to the Textile Center for both this program and for Common Threads. Common Threads has always been a, a joy to visit because I don't look at myself as an artist, but rather as a technician. I was trained as a, back when it was called home economics, I was trained as a home economics teacher and went through my career as a designer and as a, an educator. I never looked at myself and I still don't as a practicing artist, but this show, The Common Thread, gives me the opportunity to show off some of what I think. And this piece was definitely uh, conceived because of the things that were going on around us at the time. I started it in January of this year, shortly after January 6th and um, had been thinking for a long time about Dr. Maslumi's uh, work that she had um, done after the George Floyd murder. Obviously the name reflects both the social aspect of um, living in the United States, but also I'll call it the moral compass of the United States. We have people who are sure that their um, political uh, ideas are the only correct ideas. We have people who are absolutely positive that there is no good um, person who uh, has skin that's other than white. And this work depicts both of those the fiery aspect of uh, our social climate right now, the inability to accept um, the, the, um, the election outcomes and the absolutely horrible aspect of being a black man who needs to tell his son how to survive in the world if he's ever stopped by police. I uh, took this uh, idea partly from Dr. Maslumi's shows, but I also admire people like Suzanne Furstenberg who has the 630,000 white flags in the National um, uh, Mall right now. We oftentimes get um, set in our own little community and, and perhaps live with our heads in the sand. And these kinds of opportunities to speak your own mind are important to educate others. Now, maybe somebody who is looking at um, our uh, pieces at the Textile Center don't know all of the history behind it. Certainly, I didn't know the story behind Jerry's piece, and that was very touching. To me, that was just an interesting picture of a young black person. I certainly didn't know Nora's story behind her work. And it seems to me that as we visually 
uh, teach people through our ideas, we're also contributing to a more open mind. I've been involved in the textile center for a long time. In fact, I think it's, it's such a joy to have a facility like this in our community. And the, the whole aspect of bringing in shows, bringing in artists who stretch our imagination and stretch our minds is certainly important. Being the old home ec teacher in me, this piece was actually a challenge because, you know, back when maybe you took home economics, you had to finish all your seams and you couldn't have any raw edges on anything. And I purposely tried to be a little bit more primitive in my work here. Uh, and, and that was a stretch for me because I really do like finished edges and, you know, very precise things. A lot of the pieces of fabric were done in various classes at the textile center. And um, the, I, the whole idea of, of presenting something at a member show when you don't think that you're an artist was enhanced because of the classes that I've taken at the textile center to show that there are many of us who really love uh, the tactile feeling of fabrics and uh, don't necessarily think of ourselves as artists, but rather just have, uh, we just enjoy the idea of having a format where we can show off some of our stuff. I challenge everybody who's listening to use textile fibers, textile fabrics, and the whole process of creation to come up with something that makes them feel good. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Yes, absolutely. You are an artist. Everyone who is in Common Thread is absolutely an artist as well. And that's one of the most exciting things about the exhibition, right? Exactly like you said, there are so many different perspectives, seeing those different perspectives put into one, one show is one of the most awesome things that you can see, makes it dynamic, makes it more exciting. It just shows that these differences in everyone is what makes something, makes life more exciting even, and the show itself more dynamic, right? So thank you so much, this is fantastic. So um, we are going to open it up to questions that anyone may have um, from the audience. So I do see a couple of comments from the chat that I'll open up. So um, I think this was for Nora. So Melissa Lamb said, I love how you bring so many skills, interests and background experiences to your work. Um, Alice Foster said, great show. Um, Nina Robinson said, Nora's piece was one of my favorites. I took several pictures and I've been really pondering my next steps in my own practice. Um, and going on with that, so Ruth, I completely understand what you are saying about finished edges. I struggle with being what I call scrappy. <laughs> um, so Cindy Bach also said, thank you, Ruth, very well articulated. And um, let me see. Fantastic. So I have a couple of questions myself for um, that I've been kind of writing down. If anyone has any questions during this time, feel free to either, you know, shout them out or put them in the chat. I'll keep an eye on that as well. So um, Mimi, I was wondering with, with your piece, you were talking about your work's relationship to water and, you know, changing pathways with water and, and how it flows. And from the sounds of it, I'm, uh, I'm, I know this piece, I think, was created before this summer, and I know for this summer, and anyone who's been living in Minnesota knows that this is one of, I think this is the driest summer on record, where we had an absolutely terrible drought. I know northern Minnesota has been suffering because of this lack of water, and I think um, Minnehaha Falls dried up for the first time in a very, I don't know if it's ever happened personally, but um, our relationship to water, especially this, especially currently, has really been changed and challenged. Have has all of this changed how you how you think about the piece that you created, Mimi, or potential future works that you may create? 
Sure. First, I'll talk about rough edges. They actually, the first time that I tried to use rough edges, I actually held my breath and I could not do it. <laughs> and so um, when you're sharing about rough edges, I was remembering that moment and, and um, this particular piece is all rough edges. And that was very intentional in terms of the grieving is so unsettling. And so that rough edgesness to it when we're in the midst, but then looking at a distance, there's a beauty. Uh, water is very much um, on my heart these days, then I am a water protector and that's part of my activism. And the next one of the next pieces is a protest quilt around stopping line three. And so we are in such a time of our lives depend on water. Our bodies are full of water. Our first environment in the womb is swimming in water. And within that sacredness, we are facing this time of such destruction. And here in Minnesota, it's, it's such a point of reckoning about water, there is no life. And this piece, when I was sewing it, that of creating this piece of water and feeling so much destruction around us. Wow. Um, and for those who don't know, can you talk about line three a little bit more and, and what that is? Oh, where do we start? Um, line three is a pipeline currently building, being built in Minnesota. And the Canadian company is Enridge. And right from the beginning, the Indigenous Peoples, the Anishinaabe Treaty Rights were violated. And there has been, I've lost count, but it's close to 30 frack outs, which is when the drilling materials are released. So there's been multiple violations of treaty rights, treaty rights. The government officials and courts have continued to support Enridge. And uh, it's so shocking that there's even a name and it's called dewatering and Enbridge was granted a permit to dewater and they need the water to force the drills under the over 20 rivers times that they cross the rivers in Minnesota so our water is at risk in Minnesota in a very big way thank you for Thank you so much for talking about that. Um, feel free to look into it if you want to learn more. Um, I know there's stopline3.org. I know a bit about it myself, but feel free to look into it. And um, I'm sure if you have any questions, Mimi would be happy to um, talk about it some more. Um, thank you so much. Um, so let me see a couple. Let me see if there's any questions in the chat. Um, okay, so here's one from Heather Giffen. Um, Mimi has talked about her activism and how it is a part of her art making. Can the other artists elaborate on that? Did anyone want to answer that question? First, I'll do an introduction. Heather is a close friend of mine in Ohio. And actually, she and her mom just went to Cincinnati with the American Freedom Museum and an underground railroad museum to see we are the story so i'm grateful heather's on this call absolutely my my uh activism is very low key but i would take this uh forum to encourage everyone to vote in the next opportunity and uh there's a women's march on october 2nd that goes uh, from the Sculpture Garden over to Loring Park, if you're interested in women's uh, uh, rights. Absolutely. Yeah, it definitely, I, I don't, I mean, I don't know if I can identify as an activist, but I do try and take an active approach. Um, 
not daily, but I do try and do it weekly um, into engaging with what's going on that I find frustrating in the world. Um, I also, I work as a fiber arts instructor um, with a community of artists with disabilities. And so that has really gotten me involved in examining how the arts can be more accessible to everyone, whether it's just in the basic forms of um, how do we engage and teach people how to use these um, skills, but also in like who is being represented in the art world and what kind of language do we use to describe different people's arts. Um, and so that is something that I do on a daily basis is working with that community and, and seeing um, how, how can I do better. Um, but I do, I live in Ely, Minnesota, where there is, the water issue is um, constant. The, um, there's, they want to create a pipe, not a pipe, they want to do copper mining near Ely, um, underneath the Kawishui River. And so in town where I live, it's pretty tense and divided between people who are for preserving the water and the earth and then people who are for mining and there's of course a long history with within Ely um, of mining um, iron mining in specifically but now the copper mining of course is is absolute poison to our water and to our earth so it's a very different type of mining so um, in a way, like also just being um, a proud queer person and identifying that and um, showing up in my identity in a small town in rural Minnesota, northern rural Minnesota, to me kind of does feel like a small, small moment of activism. Um, but I always feel like I could do more. And I think we all can do more to stay active in changing the um, destructive powers in the world. I, I also, I spent a couple of decades with my activism mar marching shoes on, um, going back and forth to Africa and advocating for many things over there um, with healthcare and education and, and things. And I think that actual physical work kept me away from a lot of self-expression and the art that has been, was I guess I've always felt as though it would be an affront to my God if I left this world without expressing myself artistically. But I just didn't create the place or the space for it. And I feel now, like I said, I felt really compelled to do this on behalf of Gabriel especially, but I also see what a catalyst it is for um, conversation and motivation to change. I think that's, that's what Gabe and I together got the most out of this. And um, I feel like a grandma Moses of, of sorts because I have done some art pieces in the past and they've been full of anger and rage and nightmares and, and confusion, but I hadn't done much. Um, I've been storing it away in the reliquary in my, my artistic reliquary. And um, I feel now as though in the, at this time of my life being retired that I now have the opportunity to just spew, <laughs> to just just let it flow and, and I've gathered the materials and, and, and have started to create the space. And I expect that this is gonna be the beginning of a lot of noisy things uh, that express about all the stories I've gathered. I mean, even, you know, I've worked with cystic fibrosis in 15 years with HIV and all those trips to Africa. And there's a lot that I have to say and, and parented um, African boys in Minnesota. And now of course have um, mixed race grandchildren and their father was raised Muslim and is an immigrant. And there's just so much material and so many thoughts that I would like to express visually and noisily. And I, again, thank you for the opportunity to, to begin basically here to do that. So, um, Believe. And I love you said there's so much material because that has definitely two meanings on this Zoom call of the material of the stories. Especially after the, the uh, textile center garage sales. <laughs> right, especially after that. And then also the material that just pulls at our heartstrings. And, yeah. and for me 
textile art in terms of being a community textile artist really began with the names project in San Francisco during the AIDS epidemic. Yeah. And that's where I began to sense the power uh, and the ability for textiles to share stories and the stories as we're talking about activism and justice and and for me at the heart of that is who matters whose stories are lifted up whose stories are honored and even these four pieces it's about honoring and the stories within each of our pieces is incredible and inspiring and so important that and i think particularly as women and women including women's work which includes textiles so it's a time of of again being truth tellers yeah i definitely like want to reiterate that that like textile i think also just the being a textile artist and having your work showing as a textile and fiber artist is important because um i just think like going back to thinking my conversation about the gorilla girls whose work is being shown predominantly and i think predominantly it's like cis men you know cis white men um their work are being heralded as important works well I think textile and fiber works have been happening since we first existed on this planet. And often the people creating those works were women and they were doing it in the background. And we would not be able to function as a society without the clothes on our backs. And so when people ask me, well, what is fiber art? And I'm like, well, what are you wearing? And they're like, well, I'm wearing <laughs> clothes. I'm like, okay, well, let's pick it, pick it apart. You're wearing something that's woven. That is an ancient, tradition you're wearing something that's knitted that's a tradition that came from macrame one of the oldest techniques and um so like me coming into this five years ago into this tradition and teaching myself it's become an obsession because it's like oh my gosh there's so many things to discover there are so many people using these ancient skills and turning them on their heads and provoke in like in a provocative subversive way that i find really intriguing or using them as a way to protest, um, quilts being in protests, I think. And um, I'm thinking about the AIDS quilt as well. Like that was incredible and um, in part of our history. And so it's it's really cool, yeah, to, I guess, yeah, it, we should also be identifying in a way as activists if we're getting our work out there, um, challenging whose work can be labeled as fine art versus craft art or what is craft art and, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it just brings up all these great discussions. Absolutely. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, so Melissa, um, Melissa Lamb came back to uh, say, I think activism can absolutely include teaching, making art like you all have and living your truth of who you are. It's not just marching. Marching is good too, but you <laughs> are all activist role models in my opinion. So in terms of how I think, you know, I think, you know, activism is, it's pretty much living, even like living your truth, being, being present in your own body and like in these spaces, like that's activism, like living, living a life that, um, uh, that you can have these dialogues, that you can talk to people, talk to people you care about. So often I feel like messages and important messages as that, at that get, um, or come across when you're talking with, you know, your peers, family members, um, friends, usually that's when those dialogues, usually <laughs> that's when uh, d conversations that may be seen in other circles as difficult um, can become a really open and, uh, you know, free dialogue. So um, did anyone else have any questions? We have about five minutes left. I have actually a question for the other artists. I'm always intrigued with the process of coming up with an idea. And I'd like to know what you use. Obviously, my idea came from uh, news. And what were your, what were the, 
reasons why you came up with the specific art piece that you came up with? When I'm asked this question, I remember Melvina Reynolds talking about being asked where she found her inspiration. And she said, if I knew that, I'd go there every day. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, it's about showing up and paying attention and keeping a sketchbook that oftentimes is a the news that just is haunting me, or it may be a conversation and in in the people in my community as different people were dying, both from COVID and other other causes, how do we hold that grief? when we can't gather in person the way that we're used to. And that sense of those tears oftentimes being cried out, not within community, not within the traditions in person we're used to holding us, but oftentimes more so in private. And grieving is both within community and private. And so that's where this sense of this river of tears that is such presence and, and I feel like it will continue to be a presence during the pandemic and then fountains of grief that we can't even imagine that we're going to need to have expression and the arts can be very much a part of that. Yeah, I guess for me it was like this, my piece is like, oh, who is my best friend Zoe? I'm making this pair of underwear for her. Okay, what has she done in her past that like can inspire me? And she's, a, you know, inspiring just at, through her existence because I love her so much. Um, and then it was like, oh, okay, she's done a lot of paintings anatomically. Ooh, what should I do on a pair of underwear? Should I I was, you know, either thinking about doing just the uterus or just the vagina. And then it was like, maybe both. And then it's just like, I think, I think what I have is enough. Um, and then I wanted to add a playful element that maybe could like the, I think the bush is very playful and could be a way of either adding like a curtain to the um, piece, or you can kind of muss it up or mess it up so that you can see the rest of the underwear. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's how my pieces go. Usually I think people in my life inspire me and I'm working on some, a new series and it's, and I'm, I'm reflecting on all my grandparents died when I was, by the time I was uh, 12 or younger. And so I'm thinking about ways of connecting to the different women that came before me through textile work. So um, they are always, they're always inspire, inspiring. I think, um, People don't write letters the way they used to. And um, if we wanna leave some lingering legacy, which is what I usually, that's kind of what I imagine, my imaginatively refer to my efforts as is my lingering legacy. The things that I'd like to carry on. I mean, we inherit all kinds of things from our ancestors. Oftentimes it's material, but there's also a reality that, that is passed forward. And working with Gabe on this, hearing what he has to say and him hearing what I had to say is my way of um, passing on a reality that he can choose parts of to keep and other parts to reject. And in the meantime, I'm getting to know him much more. And obviously I love him very much. So that's something that I really want to do. So I think the inspiration for me at this time in my life as I am becoming Grandma Moses is that I'd like to leave something behind and I'd like to be sure that it's something that's valuable. Like as the quote I just read about leaving the wood pile higher than you found it. Um, I'm inspired to dig deep and choose the things that are important to me and try to find a way to make some noise about it that will be productive to my grandchildren as they're trying to traverse this crazy chaotic world and in concentrated form. Um, we, we had it piecemeal. I remember when I was young and I had, I had a new auntie in my family 
And we sat down for a meal and I put ketchup on my eggs and she put sugar on her cottage cheese. And we both looked at each other and didn't understand. And it was that at that time, at that young age, that I realized that people just do different things differently because of what they learn from their families. And what I saw happen around, you know, around us and around the world last year was so much more than eggs and ketchup and cottage cheese and sugar. And these kids have to figure this out. This piece gave me the opportunity to learn so much more about a beautiful person that oftentimes isn't being regarded as the person that he is. Um, so yes, this, this is an opportunity for us to have lingering legacies uh, of, of, in a positive way that will leave the wood pile higher. Um, one other thing that I remember too, when I start doing something, I don't start with a clear objective or idea oftentimes, this one I did, but, but the process wasn't clear to me. And one of my favorite artists is Keith Lobu. I don't know if you know him, he's out of Australia. He calls himself a stuff smith. And he starts a piece and does all this wonderful work. And then he digs into a shoebox of little clippings from books of um, phrases that he really appreciates. And he'll dig through that until he finds something, if I've got this correct, I hope, keep I'm doing you justice. Um, he'll find a little snippet of something that is more or less a description or an intention of what he's working on. And it helps to kind of provide clarity for the process going forward because then it has a name. So you can start with an idea or you can create an idea midway through. But for me personally, I, I'd like it to be a reflection of what, what going on inside. Thank you. Wow, fantastic. I, I can't believe I'm saying it, but it's already about that time. We're a little after 1 p.m. Um, and thank you all so much for joining us for the session today. I think it was fantastic. Um, we'll be sure to have this recording up on our site um, for you to view at any time that you may like. And as um, Mia, our communications associate, listed in the chat, you can view this exhibition online. So you can view that anytime. And if you do wanna see this show in person, please feel free to do so um, until October 16th. So um, thank you artists so much for talking about your work. I really appreciate you taking the time. And thank you, uh, thank you to the viewers for coming and uh, joining us for this great discussion. <laughs>